This video will get you started in your soldering journey to achieve your skill of solderability. There are three exercises, with each exercise preparing you for the next one. When soldering, carefully observe how the solder, flux, and heat affect the flow of the molten solder to the surfaces to be joined. You've heard the phrase, practice makes perfect, so keep practicing until you're satisfied and comfortable with the first exercise, then move to the second, get comfortable with that, and do the same for the final exercise. Some have started soldering with just a soldering tool, flux core solder, sharp knife, and something to cut wire. This can get you started, but the list that will be displayed next is a recommendation to help make practicing easier. Remember to always follow the instructions, warnings, and safety data sheets of tools and materials that you'll be using. Here is a list of common tools and materials that we'll be using. Number one, soldering station. A soldering station normally contains a soldering tool, holder, and tip cleaner, but you can get these separately if you want portability. Having a temperature controlled soldering tool is preferred because of its ability to regulate a set temperature, whereas a single wattage tool can deliver too much heat the longer it's plugged in or less heat as you make continuous soldering connections. This can cause inconsistent results. If you see the soldering tip turning blue when wiping on a damp sponge or smokes excessively when applying solder, it's too hot and should be cooled down. Number two, holder. A soldering tool holder in its simplest form helps reduce it from burning and rolling off surfaces. Holders that have additional features may provide personal protection from burns, capture solder droppings, and provide a thermal environment. Number 3. Tip Cleaner Having a damp sponge will provide a cleaning area for the hot soldering tip that has burnt flux and oxidized solder so you can reapply fresh solder to the tip for a clean process. If moist and large enough, you can lower the soldering tip temperature of a fixed wattage tool. A dry tip cleaner will remove oxidized solder and burnt flux off the tip with minimal temperature drop. Number four, soldering tip sizes. Having the right size tip for the task gives the best results. You want to complete the solder connection with the shortest possible time with the right amount of heat. Number five, wire cutter. I recommend starting with the diamond cut style instead of the flush cut. The reason is that in the beginning, you can cut too much with a flush cutter where the lead and solder are no longer connected or very little is made. Number six, knife or wire stripper. A wire stripper is preferred because of its ease of use compared to a knife, which requires practice to develop the skill. Number seven, needle nose plier. This will be used to form hooks and bends in wire and component leads. Number eight, desoldering tool or braid. As you're practicing, you may want to remove excess of solder. Also, if you have a scrap circuit board assembly, you can desolder the components without removing them to save time when practicing. Number nine, safety glasses. Needed to protect eyes from solder and when cutting wires and component leads. Number 10, gloves. Precautionary measure for handling protection. Number 11, 31 thousandths of an inch, diameter 6337 or 6040 rosin core solder also available in other sizes and material composition. Number 12, electrical tape. Besides using this to insulate exposed wire, you can use this also to temporarily hold items into position. Tinning wire. Tinning wire requires the wire, solder, and soldering tool, which keeps it simple and makes it a good place to start. Learning the skill is essential to protect wire from fraying and preparing it to be soldered in PCBs and solder cups and connectors. By forming a J-style hook with a needle nose plier, you can solder to solder lugs, hooks, and turrets. Do you have an extra detachable power cord from an old or broken computer, printer, TV, or appliance that you don't mind sacrificing? 
Most of them are constructed with three 18 gauge wires that can be used for practicing. To get them, use a knife and remove about 12 inches of the outer jacket of the cord. Cut out one of the wires. Either with a wire stripper or knife, cut insulation one inch at one end and separate slightly without removing the insulation. Rotate the cut insulation while moving away from the wire, similar to unthreading a screw. You should have a nice twisted stranded wire that will stay together while tinning. The copper wire should have a shiny appearance. If it has a dull appearance, you might find it difficult in tinning but the flux may reduce or eliminate it. Stabilize the wire by taping it down on a surface and flex the twisted wire so it's above the surface to allow the soldering tip to be positioned underneath the wire. Wet your sponge and squeeze it to remove excess water. With a globule or pool of solder on the tip, place soldering tip on the underside of the twisted wire near the insulation. You may need to add additional solder near or on the soldering tip to maintain the solder globule. As you apply this flux core solder to the wire, it will begin to flow as well as spreading the heat. Then begin moving the tip and while adding solder as needed until end of the wire. As you do this, observe how the solder and the flux flows in and around the wire strands. Apply enough solder so that you will still see the wire strands. Repeat until you feel you have the hang of it. If using a fixed wattage soldering tool, unplug it until ready to use again. Joining two wires. Now that you're comfortable tinning wires, let's join two stranded wires together. This skill will allow you to join different wires together without having to use additional materials like crimps or splices that require another tool. When you solder, you will have confidence that the connection is reliable. There are many ways to solder two stranded wires together for soldering, but we will use the skill that you learned in the beginning. Start by stripping and twisting two wires. Take the two wires and form an X, giving each a space between the insulation and intersecting point of about three times the diameter of the wire. The space will allow approximately two turns around each wire to securely hold it in place for soldering. Position wire in place with tape to stabilize if necessary. If you have a wider soldering tip, this will heat a larger area making it more efficient. Tin the wires as you did earlier with the single wire, except start in the middle since there is no end of wire. Move tip to areas that need additional heating if solder doesn't flow when feeding to other areas of the wire. While doing this, carefully observe how the solder flows. Again, repeat until you get good consistent results. Circuit Board Assembly The practice of tinning and joining wires allowed you to observe how solder flows and what to expect. With this experience, we'll use the skills that you developed and move on to soldering components to printed circuit boards. If you have a scrap printed circuit board or PCB assembly laying around, this will help you in the sense that if you need to replace a defective component, you will learn how to desolder as part of the process. If not, there are low cost PCB project kits available that you can purchase for practicing. If you have a PCB assembly, let's remove the solder with the desoldering device that you have. Let's do a few so you can get a feel of both desoldering and soldering. Make sure your soldering tip is not larger and slightly smaller than the solder area you are working on. With a solder wick, rest on the solder connection with a well tinned tip. When it gets in a molten state, you will see the solder wick up into the braid. If using a desoldering tool, load the tool, rest the well tin tip on the solder connection until molten, and position desoldering tool tip over the molten solder and activate the desoldering tool. Do a few so you can solder repeatedly to get your practice without interruption. Have a clean solder globule, make contact with the circuit pad and component lead 
then supply solder to the opposite side. If you purchased a kit to practice soldering, start inserting a few components and bend the lead slightly if possible so they don't fall out when soldering. Apply the skills that you developed and apply the soldering tip with the solder globule on the pad and component lead and apply the solder. Cut off excess lead on the component above the solder peak. Your kit may have included components which their leads don't go through the PCB but attach on the surface. This is a surface mount device or SMD and this possibly can be soldered using what you have depending on tip size and diameter of solder wire. To add this SMD, we start by applying solder to one corner of the pad. There will be some flux residue that will aid in reflowing the solder to the component lead. This will give you the opportunity to align the component leads to the rest of the pads. Once aligned, move diagonally to the farthest lead and solder component lead and pad. Solder the rest of the pads. If you apply too much solder, wipe off the solder from the soldering tip and then immediately apply to the excess amount of solder. This will pick up some of the excess solder to the tip. Repeat if necessary and after complete, immediately retin the soldering tip. Video Review in this video, we have looked at the tools and supplies that will aid in developing your soldering skill by observing how the solder and flux flows when tinning and joining wires, then applying this to soldering components to a circuit board, and repeating the process until we develop the skill. It is our hope that after viewing and applying this video, you have advanced your solder ability. Look for additional videos in our Solder Ability series to broaden your range of skills in soldering, desoldering, and resoldering.